Two weeks ago, I uh, got a call from a young man who called me and told me, Yalango, I've tried everything in my life and nothing seemed to work for me. I asked him, how old are you? He told me he's 23. <laughs> At 23, this guy had already tried everything <laughs> and nothing seems to work for him. So he was giving up in his life. At 23, I was a fisherman and a fishmonger in Homer Bay Town. That is where I begin my story. I was a fisherman who would go to the lake, cast our nets in the middle of the night, in the morning pull the nets and sell fish to the women at the show. That same picture that maybe some of you have been seeing going around on social media, that was me at the beach of Homer Bay selling fish. How did I end up being a fishmonger? You know, I went to Homer Bay Lake Primary School, Pier Box 217. <laughs> <coughs> 217, Homer Bay. That is where it all began. Born up in an average family. Going up, today there's food. Tomorrow there's no food. There's rent today. Tomorrow the houses is locked. But then I did my KCPE. And when I did my KCPE, I got a calling to Maseno School. And you know how it used to be a long time that uh, you could not get a chance to go to Maseno School or any other national school if you didn't have the money or you didn't get there in time or your chance would be taken. So my dad tried to put all the resources that he had together and we headed to Maseno School. When we got to Maseno School, it was a week later. The calling day had gone and I'd lost my chance to join Maseno School. I saw my dad pull my box, wearing, I was wearing my Maseno School uniform, and we left Maseno School. The only dream that my dad had, that this would be the way that will open doors for this humble family. We left, and I went to Barkanyango Secondary School, <laughs> pure box, 14 Nyamonye. <laughs> so I went to Barkanyango for... For, for my first year, fully dressed in a Maseno school uniform, <laughs> in a different school, because my dad could not again come back to Blackberry to buy another uniform, because he had used everything that he had. And that was it. That's where it all began. I went to the school, but then even school fees at Barkanyang on the second term became even a bigger problem. Because my elder brother, George, was also in Form 2 that time at Nyangoma Boys Secondary School, P.O. Box 23, Bondo. <laughs> so since my dad had already had a good relationship with the principal at Nyangoma Boys, I was allowed to be transferred back to, to Nyangoma Boys, and my brother had to drop school so that I could go on because he saw the potential in me better than him. So he gave me a chance to use his school fees in school. At Nyangoma Boys, school fees was not one of those things that my dad had all the time. My dad was that kind of man who would pay school fees with anything. He would bring maize, he would bring firewood. You know, you know how you, you know, school needs maize. So if I bring maize, that is also school fees. So I used to see my dad come, and he's the kind of old man who would come when People are still in the assembly. <laughs> and you wonder, why couldn't you just wait? Why couldn't you just wait up to when the assembly is done so that you can push this thing? So seeing my old man and the school team count each and every can of God of God of maize, and I knew that that was my school fees my old man was paying. Ladies and gentlemen, each and every single day, I knew that I had to make this chance count for me. I did my KCSE, and uh, at Nyangoma Boys, being the average school that it was, things like uh, Bunsen Banner, we saw the day of the exam. <laughs> this is very true. You walk into an exam, okay, it is burning, hey, hey. 
What do you do with it? A friend of mine mixed everything and it exploded. He said, observation explo explosive. Because he had never, he had never seen it anywhere. He had never seen these things anywhere. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I got C plus. Lewis don't fail. I got a very strong C plus. <laughs> <laughs> then, with my C plus, a C plus at Nyangoma Boys High School is an equivalent of an A plane at Stare or any other places. <laughs> yes. Why that I was at Masena that time, I would have gone and got myself a what? An airplane. But I was at Nyangoma Boys. And uh, armed with my C plus, I went back home. I went back to Homer Bay. And uh, there was this one year period where guys wait to later join the college. And uh, all my, the people around me, the young men we agree with, went to the colleges, universities. And at this point, I asked my dad, uh, when am I going to college? <laughs> My dad has never laughed like that. <laughs> he told me, <coughs> you've seen what I've gone through trying to take you to college. What in your sin mind thinks, uh, uh, high school, what in your sin mind thinks I can even afford to pay your college fees? That's how I got myself working at Capital Fish Kenya Limited in Homer Bay. I don't know the P.O. Box. <laughs> Because there was no reason to remind yourself of such a place or being a fishmonger at the lake or going into the darkness uh, and bringing fish in the morning to sell for the women out there. One day my dad woke up and gave me two shirts, two trousers and 800 shillings and told me go to college and go be a man. I had to rise up to that occasion. I took a bus from Homer Bay, went to Nairobi. When I landed to Nairobi, he had organized with a few guys who are his friends he had met a long time ago who were already in Nairobi at that time. When I went to Nairobi, the first place I landed was at Lavington. And uh, this guy took me through uh, his house appliances, the fridge, <laughs> the cooker, and made sure that two weeks later when I'd already known how it, everything worked in the house, he sent everybody away and I became his house manager. I became his house manager, so I would clean, wash his car, close the gate, wash his children, do everything. <laughs> and that's what I used to do. It was a relative. Then one day, I just said, this is not what I wanted. And I'd already started making contacts with a few of relatives who were in Nairobi that time. One of them is called Uncle Ching, who one day when I left Lavington, I went to live with in a place called Quare Embakasia the Islam. And he told me, I've been waiting for you. <laughs> Nobody comes from the village and goes to Lovington. This is where. <laughs> this is where it all begins. This is where it all begins. So I started staying with him in his house. In his house, that's where I stayed with him. But I knew that I had this passion of acting, which from high school and everywhere, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. But then through acting or wanting to go, I didn't know where to start from. And even before I started going to the National Theater, I'd done every single manual job in Nairobi. Mjengo, uh, Washagari, Kwanza Mjengo Mbaya, Ile Akubomoa, Wacha You know, done almost every single manual job just to try to make sure that we had food on our table. But I give it back to Uncle Cheng, who each and every single time, even after working at industrial area, still used to give me fare to go to the National Theater to pursue my passion. So one day, I got a chance to the auditions. And when I auditioned, I was taken to the second cast. There's always the first cast and the second cast. So in case the first cast, uh, somebody gets sick or ill, or the, you can always... Uh, take the role, and we were doing the set books. This was after almost three years. Nobody was getting sick or getting <laughs> or living. Nobody was living from the first cast. 
So I was back and forth, still going back to do my major jobs, coming back to the National Theatre without giving up, knowing where my passion and what I wanted to do was lying at that point. So what happened? One day we were doing the set books, and the students came in large numbers, and the show was really big. Then everybody was paid. And one person in the main cast decided to go drinking that night. So the next day, the students came again. It's a big show, but this guy is missing. And he was playing one of the lead roles in that show. And because the students had to go back to school and time was running out, I got a chance to step in. And I told God, this is the only chance that I've been waiting for. Give me the courage to prove that, you know what, I'm ready and ready for this. So everybody in the cast said, let's see what this guy will do. So they came by the wings of the, of the theater or the curtains to see how I was going to spoil their big play because I was a no one. And to date, I still remain one of the best Swahili narrators at the National Theater. Because when I got on that stage that day, I gave it my all, and to date, I still remember every single word of that show. I went on that stage, and it was the opening, and I said, Karibuni sana katika kie mwisho wa kosa. Niriwailo andikuwa na Z. Bruani na kuchapishwa na Longhorn Publishers. Na kwa idhini ya Longhorn, kuna kiliwa kwa tamthilia. Na aibu na Jasper Okda, mkurugenzi wa kikundi marufu jicho for productions. Kikundi kinacho jishugulisha no igizaji jukwani vitabu vya fasihi katika shule za upili nchini Kenya. Ili tujue ni mskayupi ya lotenda kosa lipi na vipi na lini na kwanini. Jiunge nasi, toka hapa di ufuni mwabahari. Mili eti, you understand? I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And that guy, wherever he was, and he was drinking, he was told, you, <laughs> go on drinking. <laughs> and from that day, I got the chance to be on that stage again and again and again. Then I'm not the kind of person to stay at a place for a long time. We decided, you know, this acting is not, uh, this set books is not working really well. Because how much were we being paid? 200, 300 per day, per book and everything. We decided to venture in a different venture. We decided to put Luo plays together. The Luo plays that we started, and I've seen one of the people, first people to ever record us. Al Wandago, are you? Albert? Alwan? Alwan, I saw you. There he is. This is the guy who put up that amazing Luo play called <laughs> Kibrito Luarepi. And uh, Governor is here. He never missed any of our plays at the uh, National Theatre. <laughs> He never missed. He never missed any of our plays at the National Theatre. And I appreciate you and thank you for holding my hands throughout that time. And uh, after all that, one day, we decided, you know what? Let's start and try something on television. That time, Citizen TV had started bringing up the new local programs. Papa Shirandula, Inspector Mwala, all that were coming up. Then, we were called up for Papa Shirandula. For one scene, we brought her, our sister was getting married, and there are supposed to be relatives coming from Mugenya, <laughs> and we were just to make an appearance in one scene. And I told my best friend Otoyo that, you know, listen, this is the chance we've been waiting for. When that camera roll, let us do anything possible for these people to retain us in this play. So when the cameras went on, Everything that we've been told, we were told to do, we didn't do. <laughs> we did what we had planned together. And we made them change the script that, uh, you know what, when everybody was going back to Kenya, Jalang and Otoy jumped through the window of the bus, and they are still somewhere in Nairobi, for them to look for how to put us in that script. You see, that gave me one big, very big lesson, that any time you get a chance to do something, do it and give it your all. You only have two chances. You either do it or you don't do it. There's never doing it, oh, kidogo, kidogo, no. Give it your best. <laughs> and things happened very quickly. Things happened and turned very quickly. The same time we just, we were just starting to make our names on this show, Nyambane had just left Kiss 100. And Kiss 
had called out for the search of the person to replace Nyambane. So you know how Kiss was big and is big at, uh, at announcing uh, such a vacancy. And people came, 1,001 of them. And uh, the first thing that happened is a crowd like this, they came out and said, uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, if you have a degree, step to the left. If you don't have, step to the right. Remember, me mean a degree. <laughs> 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 I never seen the doors of the university at that time. But I said, what will happen? What, what can really happen? So I went to the guys with the degree. And I stood there. I went to the side with the, with the people with the degree. And I stood that side. Then they came again and said, if you have a degree, thank you so much for you people who have a degree, but if you have a degree in media-related studies, stand to the left. If you don't have, please, thank you for coming. Oh. <laughs> I went to be with the people who had a degree in. I was just asking myself, what will happen? What's the worst they can do? <laughs> then they asked and said, now, almost to the last part, if you have a degree, and it's a degree in uh, communication, and now, if you've been in any radio show or TV show, move to the right. I went to the right, and other people left, and we were left seven of us out of that thousand people. Now it was the time now to face the panel. Remember, I don't have anything these people are asking. <laughs> confidence, my guy, confidence. 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 What's the worst that can happen? Nothing. They'll just tell you, you are not qualified. But I say, let me see what happens to the inside this interview. So I went and uh, quickly they asked you, they quickly asked you, please bring your papers and everything, introduce yourself as you, I told them uh, first, thank you so much for this opportunity. I don't have anything you've been asking for, but uh, I think I'm the person you're looking for. All of them went quiet. And a man called Patrick Wako Pikiu, the owner of Radio Africa, told me, I think I like this guy. When everybody was leaving, he still stood and made sure that he's here without all these things. Let's try him on air. So we were, uh, we were seven of us that were tried on air. And the first day, I went on air with Caroline Mutoko. And uh, it was a big thing. Caroline was this uh, untouchable, no nonsense woman. And I'm wondering, now what will, what will I say? Now walk in. First, she's too beautiful. Uh. <laughs> so I, I, I'm stuck in looking at her. So what happened is, she introduced the show that morning, and she said, oh, welcome, this is Keys 100, Nairobi's number one music station. My name is Caroline Mutoko, and I'm with, so I'm still, I went blank. And she told me, speak, young man. I told her, woman, where I come from, women, women do not, do not speak very loud to men. Reduce your volume. <laughs> so she switched off the microphone and told me nobody has ever told me anything like that <laughs> but I think I like you are you ready now <laughs> so we went on and the trials went on all these guys were, tri were tried and tried and it got to a point where everybody was being dropped in the third week the two people were dropped off the seven ah uh, the second week came, another two were dropped, so we were left the three of us. On the last week now, we were three of us, one person left, and I was left with Larry Asego. Now it was the day to determine who is going to replace Nyambane. So me and Larry were called in there, and we're standing up there. And they told us, it's been a long journey trying to look for this replacement, and today the journey ends, and... Uh, We've decided we will employ both of you. <laughs> so all those other guys with their degrees and everything, <laughs> and I'm here standing. So if you remember very well, we went to Naya, the three of us, Caroline, Larry, and Jalang, because the trial was still going on. Two months later, Larry was dropped, and I was left 
as a co-presenter with Caroline, the two of us from all that journey. Told me, taught me one thing, confidence and always believing that you can do it. Even when nobody else believes in you, you can always do it. Rise up, guys. Rise up. And we created one of the biggest, biggest shows in the country, Kiss 100 Breakfast Show. Three years later, I decided that this was not everything because I hate being in a comfort zone where you see each and every morning you wake up, no challenge, you guys are always number one and everything. I woke up and went to Radio Maesha, which was a number 48 radio station at that time. And we created a, a, a collab with a friend of mine called Alex Mwakideo. We knew that it's about commitment. Radio is not hard. But to find somebody who, my day, each and every day starts at uh, 3.30 in the morning. By 4, we are ready at work. We have two hours of prep and then make the show go on because we prepare for two hours because we are going to talk for four hours. So very few people or young men who come to those shows are able to put up that kind of work. The discipline and making sure that where you, wherever you are, make sure that you show up. We created this show. The first uh, quarter, we were at number 28. We said this thing can be done. Then we came to number 17, to number 18. On the second day, on the last quarter, Radio Maisha was number one morning show. And to date, to date. Then when it became number one, I said, ah, why not? Let's try something new. That's where I am now at, with Jeff Koenange at Hot 96. Still pushing and making sure that I'm building my brand each and every single day. But the saddest thing that happened to me, that same day Caroline Mutoko told me that you know what, you've been uh, taken in as a replacement is the same day my dad passed on. I really wish that he was able to be here today to see what all this. But he wrote for me a letter before he died and told me make sure that you get, make sure that uh, you build your mama house and make sure that your siblings go to school. I got my mama modest place back in Shags, where she lives, and my brothers went to school, and that's why I'm in college right now. They came my baby. <laughs> Hopefully enough, I will graduate in uh, 2019 if the strikes stop. But uh, <laughs> if they eventually stop, but uh, to me, giving back and making sure that against all odds you can always still stand up and become what you do. Nobody has ever known how little my education is for that matter. But I stand and inspire so many young men here in Kisumu who I still look back to and I've always made sure that whatever little I can always come back and bring back to Kisumu, I've always done. I have a few investments down here that I've got guys who actually work with us here and make sure that I inspire them to be what they want to be in life. In Nairobi, I do that morning radio show, but I run a company called Arena Media. Arena Media is a below the market and above the market uh, advertising agency. We are big in uh, TV advertisement. We've created some of the biggest brands out here and marketing uh, strategies out here for so many big brands. How did I start Arena Media? I used to be called to MC events. Then I would wake up and say, you know what? Uh, there's somebody who brought the speakers and the sound. So I'd go and tell the person calling me to MC and tell them, you know, I don't use any other person's microphone. I use my own. So they would hire me plus my sound. <laughs> then later I realized, ah, there's somebody who was coming with photography. So I tell me, you know, there's some cameras that do not work very well in event. So if you want me in your event, you take me, my, myself, my sound, my camera. I didn't have a band, but I could go and hustle a band and make them my personal band and tell them, you know what? So from today, whichever show we are going, I'll always be going with you if they need a band. So anytime I went to a ne negotiation table, I would sit down and tell them, if you want me to MC your event, I come with my band, my photographer, myself, my sound and everything. So we all got all that together. And that's how we started supplying sound stage and everything. That told me one thing. When you see an opportunity somewhere, grab it and run away with it. There's always bigger opportunities up here. And Kisumu, 
Kisumu is just starting up, and we do very good jobs. One of the jobs we've done was actually for Archie uh, back in uh, 20, uh, must be 2010, 2011. 2011, we did one of the biggest advertisements for them, uh, for Pangoni Resort Hotel in Mombasa. And it was a big thing. From that, we've created some big advertisement. Usiseme maziwa sema? Tissue, see your tissue, tissue ni? And you see things like that, and people relate to it. And we've created brands out there from little thinking and making sure that no opportunity passes us. Kisumu, rise up, it is our time. Thank you.